academic programs here at the Modern Art Museum of Fort Worth. I want to welcome you guys. Um, you know, I know that we're all very busy. You know, whether you're a student, whether you're a teacher, principal, superintendent, et cetera, we all have crazy lives. I really appreciate you guys taking the time to come here <clears throat> and connect with the museum. Um, I very much value the work that you guys do in the community. Um, you know, my position here at the museum, it makes me a liaison between the museum and the academic community. Uh, the joy of my job is, you know, when I get to help students connect or watch students, um, just get excited about the world of art, sharing that with them. Uh, you know, my goal is to facilitate, you know, really meaningful exchanges for students to learn through the works of art that are here in the museum. Uh, another one of my goals is to make the modern a valuable resource for you guys, the educators of all different levels. Uh, I value the relationships I have with you very much, and I really want to use this museum's resources um, you know, to facilitate really meaningful exchanges for you as well. Um, this evening is about bringing together educators of all different levels and specialties simply to have a conversation about art education. Uh, it's about emphasizing and celebrating the importance of art education in our schools, it's about introducing you guys to innovators in the field of our education and their dynamic ideas. Uh, I also want to create a social scene where educators can connect with each other and just enjoy this museum. Um, you know, I call this event Modern Connections. It's because that's what I, want, that's what I really hope happens, that you guys um, connect. You know, you connect with innovative thinkers and their interesting ideas. You connect with each other, you know, connect with this museum. Um, I really want this museum to be your museum. Um, just to let you guys know a little bit how the evening is going to unfold. Uh, in a few moments, I'm gonna, we're going to enjoy a lecture by the renowned educator, Julia Marshall. Um, that's going to be followed by a reception in the lobby where there's light refreshments and live music played by Pascal's Jazz Band and uh, free admission to the galleries for extended hours. So um, that'll be until 8 p.m. The exhibitions on view are selections from the permanent collection, as well as urban theater, New York art in the 1980s. Um, after this presentation, if you guys have any questions about the exhibitions or tours or programs that I do or anything at all, please find me. I'll be in the lobby uh, until 8. And I also have CPE certificates on hand. If you guys um, want those, grab me. Um, at this point, I have the honor of introducing our speaker for the evening. So Julia Marshall is currently the chair of art education at San Francisco State University. She's been uh, the professor of art education there since 1988. She holds an MFA in sculpture from the University of Wisconsin and a doctor of education from the University of San Francisco. Julia began her career and taught for many years as an artist in the schools in the Bay Area where she specialized in art integration for elementary, middle, and high school students. Um, her primary scholarship is in curriculum development, arts integration, and uses of contemporary art in art education. She's given tons of presentations on contemporary art and art education at NAEA conferences, at symposia in Seoul, South Korea, in Taipei, Taiwan, Hong Kong, Athens, Greece. Um, her publications include articles in art education, studies in art education, and just recently co-authored Art-Centered Learning Across the Curriculum, Integrating Contemporary Art into Our Secondary School Classroom, uh, which is really amazing. Um, you know, this book straightforwardly lays out exactly what art-centered integrated learning is. Uh, it elucidates on the ways to integrate and relate multiple disciplines by way of contemporary art. Uh, it's, all of, it's also full of practical information, interesting ideas that uh, could help to explore the natural sciences, the social sciences, history, geography, creative writing, and mathematics all through art, basically making visible um, the interconnectedness of all subjects. Julia's work positions art as a way of thinking and as a lens to view and understand the world. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Julia Marshall. Thank you, Nathan. That's really kind. And a shameless promotion of my book, <laughs> which we love. What? So you don't have to do it now. I don't have to do it now. You did it for me. Thank you so much. Wow. Um, it's great to be here. And wow, there's a great group here. It's really big. It's wonderful. Um, 
So let me just ask you this question. How many of you are art teachers? Aha, great. How many of you are generalist teachers? Aha, oh, we're alone, everybody. Oh, one, one, we've got one. Okay, how many of you are students? Are students? Or mostly art teachers. Okay, how about elementary? Who's elementary? Do we have any college? Oh, good. Great. Anybody kindergarten below, like preschool? Terrific. Wonderful. So we're running the gamut. Great. I, um, I hope to talk to hope to talk to all of you and with all of you about some interest, some ideas that are sort of igniting my thinking, and um, which relate, of course, to contemporary art, which of course fits into where we are today at the museum. It's really exciting to be here at the museum. Wow, this is a great museum. It's really, really wonderful. So it's terrific to be here. And um, what I'd like to talk to you today is about uh, a little bit about contemporary art and some of the things that I've noticed in it. Um, and um, one of the things that I, I've heard in my travels around is that, um, that a lot of people don't really know how to to either look at contemporary art or use it, or um, it's just confounding and confusing. Um, some of it is downright confusing, and actually it's supposed to be, probably. That's part of it, it's supposed to get you thinking. And, um, and some of it is really actually quite um, wonderfully revealing. And that's what the, the revealing stuff is what I'd like to talk about tonight. Um, so let's just get going here. Um, my, I've been really interested in, as Nathan mentioned, I'm interested in, in integration. I'm interested in how the arts are similar uh, to and different from the other disciplines that we teach in schools. And um, I'm really interested in education as, an, as a to understand to understand things deeply. And what I love about art is it helps us to understand things deeply, but also in different ways. Um, so one of the things we've been talking about a lot in education these days, and you probably recognize this, being teachers, is that we're, a fo we're looking to foster thinking and learning and understanding more and more. And um, how do we do that? How do we use our contemporary art to do that? And that's what I'd like to talk about today. And I want to give you some ideas about some very simple ways to go about doing that. Um, so as art teachers, I'm sure that you are dealing with this, the Common Core Standards, and the Next Generation Standards in Science. You're not having to, to deal with them directly, but you're certainly hearing a lot about them at your school. Yes? Okay. There's a lot of controversy around the, the standards um, because of all the testing and changing over and all of that. But I want to, I, my, my feeling is that this is a great time to be an art teacher. And the reason why is this. Art is about thinking, and it's about thinking deeply. It's about coming to understandings. It's about ideas and feelings. It's about doing. It's about process. And this is what the Common Core Standards initially were all about. So can, why can't we use art and art making to help the other teachers make those core standards? We can, we can show them that in the art class, kids are doing a lot of the things that the Common Core Standards ask for. Looking at complex texts, there's nothing more complex than an art piece. It's like a complex piece of literature. Um, coming, arguing for a point of view, we do that in our critiques. Looking at things from different points of view and having discussions around big ideas, we do that in our art classes. So why can't we tell our administrators that Common Core needs us? 
So I'm not sure how you are in Texas if you're battling to keep your art classes in your schools. Are you doing that? Do you have a problem with that? You don't. I'm from California. We fight every year to keep our art classes all over the state. So we have to go into our administrators' offices and always remind them of what we do and why it's important, because we're the first to go. And it's happening all over the state. It has been for the last 20-some years. But it seems to always get worse. So anyway, we need to do that to argue. Lucky you, you don't have to argue for your place. Texas is way ahead of us. Um, anyway, so um, what I'm going to suggest is creatively playing with ideas, knowledge, methods, and forms. And this is what artists do. They creatively play with these four things, with ideas, with knowledge or information, with different kinds of methods that different disciplines use, and they also play with different forms. So um, these, the, the key word here is creatively. And the next key word, of course, is play. And play is such an important part of coming to understand things, of looking at things from different perspectives, of coming to new understandings. And that's what I want to talk to you a little bit about today, is playing. So we're going to talk about different creative strategies that artists use to play to play and come to make meaning, to convey concepts, to make their thinking visible. And you see visible thinking today. And to reframe the world, to make us see it differently. So you got a list, you got a handout when you came in? This one's not on the handout, so I already went off the farm. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm not very good at sticking with what I start with, so I kind of add some stuff, so sorry about that. But actually, the, uh, what you have there in the handbook, the hand, uh, are some very simple strategies that I'm going to show you where you can actually see the artist's thinking. And um, you can see what they're doing in the, creatively to play with ideas and to make concepts come alive and do it visually. And these are things that you can do with your students very easily, and you probably are doing them already. So let's start with reinterpreting. And I bet some of you are already doing that. Remaking an icon. This means an icon, of course, is something that you can recognize, right? If you, if it, you don't really recognize it, it doesn't make sense to redo it. But um, so an icon has a lot of meaning. So here's an example. And you recognize the icon, don't you? Girl with a pearl, Vermeer. Feel free to pipe up, ask questions, whatever, OK? So um, this is uh, Awal Air. Iriscu up here, African-American artist, a photographer in New York, and that's Yasumasa Morimura, who's a Japanese artist, who has done, um, whose whole entire milieu is in about reinterpreting art history, or um, actually now he's gotten into popular sort of media images. And um, this is the girl with the bamboo earring. And this one over here is his por a portrait where he puts himself into his portraits. Have anybody seen his work before? Oh, you're in for a treat. Do we have anybody who teaches art history? OK. Look him up, because he does all of the art history specials, I like to call them. So here's a couple examples. So he's not the only one who does this. There are other artists that do this. And I'm giving you just a, a taste. But you can find on the web tons of these. And they're really great to show kids, because kids will see so, uh, how an artist takes something that's almost sacred and plays with it, updates it, gives a spin to it. And often the spin is he's playing with gender. He's playing with expectations. He's playing with um, uh, a sense of, um, of sort of a time-honored concept that comes that he's updating it. You know, something that uh, was important, say, to Frida, her identity as represented in symbols, 
and to Velasquez, uh, royalty, and this lovely little innocent uh, child who is a princess. Um, these things he plays with. He plays with these ideas. He updates them. He bends them. He, he reinterprets them. Um, the, another one is juxtap juxtaposition. Um, this is a really easy one. Just putting one thing next to another where it really contrasts with the other thing so that um, you see something um, in relationship to something else. So here's uh, the typical juxtaposition is your collage. This is Michael Oatman. Yeah. I'm not going to try to reinterpret uh, these for you. I'm going to see, uh, I'm going to let you uh, quote unquote make meaning and try to figure out what he's up to and what he's trying to say. But what I really want you to look at is the creative strategy that we're seeing, how things are juxtaposed to each other to make that kind of initial little shock. And some of these, I hear little giggles. Hopefully you'll, you'll laugh and giggle through this whole thing because there's a lot of giggling uh, opportunities here of where people put things next to each other or shape things in different ways. Um, this one being another one, which is the loudest <laughs> of the giggles. And of course, that kind of dates itself, too. This is from the late 80s. Um, now it would be with all those cars that seem to look exactly alike, all those things with the tiny little windows in the back. And, yeah, and I'm sure you recognize nice, the icon we're dealing with here. Well, two icons, the Volkswagen bus. The bug is a, definitely an icon. And so is Syrah. This one's a little more difficult to sort of um, figure out, but this is Nam June Pike, uh, a Korean artist who um, uh, was kind of a father of video art or in, in television art and used a lot of television sets. And um, this one is, um, you, if you contemplate it for a little while, you contemplate it while he contemplates himself and the video camera contemplates him and we have a feedback loop here. So there's a nice little juxtaposition, television set and Buddha. Yeah, okay, this one. This one was um, for a special show in Denmark. Uh, have you seen knit tagging? Do you know knit tagging? It's really wonderful. I love knit tagging. And then this one seems to be sort of the, be the best version of knit tagging I could find. I particularly like the little pom pom hanging off the end of the, the gun. Okay. Um, this next one is Mark Dion. And this is going to take you a minute to see what the funny job from juxtaposition is. Oh. Does anybody see it? Pop culture. Where is the pop culture? Top shelf. Top shelf. Great. Um, do you know anything about the cabinets? Curiosities to unpack this, you have to kind of know something about it. Well, I should tell you something about all these things. Anybody know something about the cabinets of curiosities? Well, Joseph Cornell did a lot of those, didn't he? Who? Joseph Cornell. Oh, yes, Joseph Cornell. He came out of that same, he came, he was the one who made artwork out of the cabinet of curiosity idea. So, cabinets of curiosities um, are sort of a historical um, beginning of um, the Natural History Museum. And back in the 17th, 16th, and 17th centuries, um, 18th century, uh, in Europe, uh, these people, um, quite often very rich people, would uh, go around and collect all sorts of things and make these cabinets. This was their sort of personal collection, art piece, 
and they juxtapose things, and they often ju would juxtapose things like skulls and bones and bugs, and then with cultural artifacts. And so there was always this sort of interesting relationship between like little uh, pieces that they would chop off parts of the, uh, the pyramids and stuff. I mean, it was terrible. They were going around and, you know, taking things off of monuments and stuff and different sculptures they'd found and things like that. And then they would have these pieces that were parts of animals. So there was always sort of this interesting cross pollination and a conversation between these objects. And Mark Dion, who is a contemporary artist, has really taken the whole notion of the Cabinet of Curiosity and the Natural History Museum and really studied it and made his own work in the, you know, sort of in the mode of it, but also critiquing it. And he has updated it by putting pop culture at the top. So this updates it to now. So you can see that he's juxtaposing it with sort of the history of the cabinet of curiosity. And any of us who have collections that we have in our houses, stuff we have on our dressers, bookshelves and stuff, we have our own cabinets of curiosities. In some ways, our houses are cabinets of curiosities, right? And your art teachers, I bet your car is a cabinet of curiosities. Is it not? You should see mine. Yeah. Uh, oh, that project. When did I do that project? Oh, that was September of 2010. What's it doing under the seat? You know, that kind of thing. Do shadow boxes, is there a connection to shadow boxes? I think shadow boxes come out of that same aesthetic. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. They come out of the same thing. This is one of his other wonderful juxtapositions. <laughs> <laughs> this one is one of his best. He always um, substitutes Mickey Mouse for uh, Cuvier, who is a French scientist who did all of the um, work with paleontology and did a lot of you know sort of categorizing and trying to figure out where different animals were placed in um, the big family tree. And um, so Mickey is his replacement, but you see here, as you notice, the bottles where you would really expect real dead animals. These are the animals that probably are going to be preserved, right? These are the ones we're going to, these are the ones that are, yeah. <coughs> Pink Panther. That's dating this one too. Okay, layering. This is um, superimposing one image onto another, but here we're fusing it together more. And I found a lot of examples of this in um, art from around the world that's that is speaking about globalization and this sort of collision of Western and Eastern culture and mo new culture and sort of traditional culture. So this is at Tenmoyo Hisashi. Um, or Hisashi Tenmoyo, depending on how you want to say it. And he's updating Japanese, the, a, a sort of traditional Japanese um, style, styles and genres. And um, as you can see, he's talking about soccer, and he's also talking about graffiti and gangs. Um, and that, if you, that is the very famous Buddha at Kamakura in Japan. Um, he does a beautiful job of this. Um, yeah, look at that awesome Buddha over there with the guns. It's pretty amazing. And knives. Lots with robots in traditional samurai costumes and done with in the style of Japanese, um, you know, the gilded Japanese uh, painting. Um, he's very popular in Japan for this kind of il um, illustration of that sort of collision. And this is probably my favorite piece of art by him. <laughs> Can you see possibilities for doing things with your kids in any of this stuff? Yes. Oh gosh, I hope so. 
uh, this, and it's such a, it's the thing about these things is that they are really simple little things you can do, but they can hold so much complex meaning when you start to, after you start doing these juxtapositions and fusing. They, it's just a simple strategy that can make a lot of meaning. And also it's a way of playing with the way things are and making you, helping you to see them differently. This was a little more serious. This is Marion Heyerdahl. This is her Terracotta Women's Project. She's Norwegian and she spent some time in China. In Xi'an, with the Xi'an warriors and their factory there, they have a big ceramic factory there where they make the re reproductions. And she shaped them into women and children. The horse is supposed to be Frida Kahlo. Frida keeps kind of, going to keep bouncing up here. Now this is a very serious commentary about war. And um, some of these, you know, this is a strategy for making commentary about issues that matter as well. This Shang Hong Tu, this guy, my favorite right now. He's got today on Thursday, October, whatever this is, this is my favorite artist. Tomorrow, maybe somebody different, but this is the guy. Um, you may recognize this down here in the corner. The Bird's Nest, Ai Weiwei, and Architects did that. That's from the Olympics, the Chinese Olympics. When was that, 2008? Yeah. I think so. Up here, you may recognize the style. Do you recognize the style? It's Cubism, right? And he, look what he's done. Do you see the Bird's Nest? Yeah. And woven into this cubist version of something that's already quite cubist in itself um, are things about freedom and free speech. So it's a political statement as well, because as you know, Ai Weiwei is the dissident artist who's been in so much trouble in China, now has a new show, Alcatraz, in the Bay Area, San Francisco Bay Area, and is very famous for his political statements. So Zhang Hang Tu is really actually a great example of someone, he's very interested in taking Western styles and reinterpreting things that are Chinese. So like that, for instance. And I'm sure you recognize that style. Good, I like that. A traditional Chinese landscape done in the style of Van Gogh. But these are the best. <laughs> Aren't they great? If you've ever seen those Chinese bells, he nailed it. And the Coca-Cola bottle is quite. And I'm sure you recognize the Chinese uh, porcelain style with the, yeah. I'm sure you can think of some really great ideas using these strategies, uh, interfacing the old and the new. One of the things I love about doing this kind of thing is it reinforces the idea for your students that there is a continuum, that there's, there is a history that we're building on and that we're refashioning and reshaping every day. And every new form sort of comes from somewhere else. And when we contrast it to one that went before, we can see it, we can see both of them, that sort of relationship and continuum. But here, of course, you know, this whole version, of, this whole th vision of Chinese culture, popular culture, as, um, I don't know, sort of taking over popular culture with a Chinese history and then seeing how now th the McDonald's and the Coke bottle are so much part of Chinese culture, sort of an interesting message. This is Ang Tsiren Sherpa. He is a Nepalese artist uh, with Tibetan roots and he is a traditional Tonka painter. And Tonkas are the um, soft sort of scroll paintings from Nepal and Tibet that are all Buddhist. 
Um, you know, they're, all, they're Buddhist paintings and they have very specific iconography. And he uses this iconography and attaches it to or fuses it with his new reality, which is in Los Angeles, which you can imagine is a pretty big culture shock. There's a lot of difference between LA and Kathmandu. So yeah, uh, although a lot of popular culture has come to Kathmandu right now. But he plays with these forms, like the polka dotted underwear is pretty good. But this one has got all kinds of interesting implications. This one over here, the stock market fluctuation economy thing, and the Buddha. Um, there's really sort of, that might be, talk about complex texts, uh, going back to the Common Core. Having students sort of unpack some of these images would be great sort of uh, thinking exercise. And trying to, lots of different interpretations would come out. And they could do, debate which, what they thought was the correct, you know, the interpretation that made the most sense. And that one is, that one opens up all kinds of things. I talk about this one with different students all the time, and it's very interesting to see what people come up with. I love this guy's work. It's just so beautiful. And for this, you really have to understand, you have to be familiar with the iconography. So this is one way, actually, contemporary art is one way to get kids interested in art history by showing them what contemporary artists do with art historical icons, like we were seeing in the beginning. They get a lot more interested in the girl with the pearl earring if they see some contemporary Japanese artist playing with it. Because they can see that it's uh, actually somebody now is working with that icon and is still alive. These, they could find out, look at this kind of iconography and then see what an LA artist is doing with it. So it's sort of an entryway into some things that may, they may not, you know, they may think, oh, it's too old. But here it's updated, it's new. So this is Enrique Shigoya. Can you read it? That's a little political commentary from our friend's uh, friend in uh, San Francisco Bay Area. He's a, um, a Chicano artist, um, Mexican-American, and he does really pretty wild and interesting political commentary, juxtaposing. This one, not, this is not what he usually does. He usually does juxtapose this um, traditional Mexican, um, the books. Now I'm having a senior moment, what are they called? You know, the long folding books? It'll come to me. What? They're accordion books. They're definitely accordion books. Um, and it'll come to me um, with uh, political and um, pop culture imagery, particularly Mickey Mouse, seems to be still very big, um, with Aztec imagery. It's very interesting. But this here, he's, of course, taking an American icon and playing off of Andy Warhol, I'm sure you recognize that, and talking about an issue right now, even as we speak. Ponzi chowder and stimulus minestrone and bailout bisque. They're pretty good. Mortgage broker stew, executive bonus consomme, auction house chili, mergers, acquisition, and lentils. <laughs> All-American treasury with pork. <laughs> Freddie mac and cheese, that's pretty good, and Wall Street gumbo. I like them. And then this one. And here's Frida again. She's back as a Frida's and Diego Itas. You know, I think in, when you're making political commentary, you can do it in very serious ways and can be very powerful. Sometimes doing it in a funny way is even more effective. It's almost like making really things, making things really beautiful. You can get past a barrier. Sometimes if you make them funny, you can get past a barrier as well. 
and he does. He uses humor all the time. It's very powerful stuff. But this one is, you know, it's fun commentary. There's Mickey Mouse's hand uh, about popular culture. And here's a fusion um, and sort of hybrid thing. This is uh, Amy Frances Cheney, um, who is another Bay Area artist, young artist. And she works with something called Future Farmers. And they do a lot around ecology and um, eco-awareness. And here she's made um, some tools that you might want to use in your garden for urban gardens. Uh, project. This is another one. This is one um, we often think of as using your imagination. Um, is it pro projecting out, sort of envisioning something that's not there based on something that's already there? It's a little hard to project and imagine out from, some, from nothing. You have to start from somewhere, from your experiences, and our imagination is based on our experience. So um, projecting is envisioning from an alternative reality of some sort. Um, so here's Packard Jennings and Steve Lambert. Um, Packard Jennings is another Bay Area artist. I seem to be pushing Bay Area artists and pushing my book, push, push, push. Um, but Steve Lambert is a New York artist. They're young, and um, they're both quite political. Um, they do something called shop dropping. Have you ever heard of that? Look it up. It's really fun. It's illegal. Don't do it. Um, I had a student almost get in trouble for it. Um, it. That's where you actually make products and put them in stores. It's the opposite of shoplifting. And they're usually funny little things that, may, that completely disrupt the, you know, the cash register and all of that. Uh, Packard Jennings does that. He makes little action figures um, and puts them in, tar in Targets, in Targets, Target stores. Anyway, I digress. Um, uh, he's inspiring. Um, anyway, uh, he and Steve Lambert did a project in San Francisco where they re-envisioned San Francisco. And what they did is, this is a research project, they went and talked to city planners and designers and engineers and all kinds of people who would listen to him and talk to him, to them, and asked them what would they like to see in San Francisco. And then they came up with a series of very large posters, and these were on Market Street in San Francisco, sort of envisioning a more utopian San Francisco. And Candlestick Park is our state we are now just about to tear down. It was our baseball and football stadium for a long time. And see, they're envisioning it as a, as a farm. And then uh, San Francisco as a life, uh, wildlife refuge. They have some other ones about the Muni, uh, different kinds of bungee dr jumping in off of, as part of transportation and high lining, whatever you, that thing where you roll on a line. Lots of really cool things. BART stations as yoga, you know, BART cars, which is our, our metro, as yoga, places where you can do your yoga and stuff like that. So, yeah. Um, and then a little more dystopic vision is Alexis Rockman. Um, it, this is his rat evolution. Yeah. Ouch. Ick. So another kind of projecting is trying to get into the head of someone else, being empathetic. And this is Amy Youngs. Um, she is um, a, an eco-artist who teaches at Ohio State University. She's a graduate of my university, actually. And um, she does a lot of things around animals, especially animals we don't pay much attention to. And she worries about lab rats and lab animals. I would, too, after looking at Alexis Rockman's painting we just looked at. Um, and she worries about, you know, how they're treated and what kind of lives they have. So she projects herself into these creatures. And this one is um, house crickets. And house crickets are raised in labs, but they can't go outside because they're little hothouse crickets. They're like, um, they can't exist in the real world. And so she decided to make them a little place um, where they could live in their little sounds in there and of waving wind. And she projected a tree, and she made it as comfortable and beautiful as natural as she could for a house cr cricket. Then she put a little... Um, 
a little uh, microphone in there and the crickets started to chirp. So when you walk into this, you can hear all this wild and happy chirping, happy, happy crickets. And so that's what that is. So that's a kind of projection. And this is another person who's kind of a bio artist. His name is Bill Burns. And he's concerned about little animals. What do they do when there's a forest fire, right? What do they do when it's really cold outside? So he decided to make costumes for them. You know, safety gear. And uh, yeah, little gloves and little, you know, just safe, you know, what do you call those things? Flotation to vests and stuff like that. So that's a kind of projection too. Go into the reality of a little mole or a vole or a cricket. So here's another one, formatting. The, um, mapping is one of my favorite creative strategies and it's of course arranging information in, uh, or ideas in spatial relationships. It's making things visible. It's making relationships visible. And here we see how um, actually making thinking visible is really making thinking visible. Uh, we've been seeing how a creative strategy is actually, you can actually see them happening in the work. These are, this is about making ideas visible. So here's Jer Thorpe. Um, he's one of many um, sort of what I would call, uh, what do we call these people, information artists. Um, and um, these are taken, he's doing a, a graphic map of different items in the New York Times. He was an artist at the New York Times for a long time. Well, two years, that's not so long. Um, and he did uh, all of these different graphics around the news stories. And um, if you look at this website by Manuel Lima called Complexity, it's full of these wonderful graphic representations of information that have become art. And they look very organic and beautiful and flowing. Here's another one of his. This one is about the Republicans and about Barack Obama. This is from 2011. And for math classes, this is really interesting stuff. And um, if you are uh, in your art class, or friends with a math teacher, it might be really interesting to do some kind of mapping around some mathematical ideas in your classroom. So this is Matthew Ritchie, he's another one. And um, he's very interested in complexity and chaos and our sort of overload of information that we're dealing with. And he really maps it out in these amazing sort of complex organic paintings and sculptures. So he tries to make that sort of information, chaos and complexity visible. Um, this is called Proposition Player. Um, it's all these sort of mappings of information from the web. And then he has a whole thing on chance there as well. So he's really interested in complexity and chaos. And if you look at these drawings and this painting and drawing by him, um, they're both very reminiscent of things that you see in uh, fractal geometry. Um, Benoit Brent Mandelbrot, the very famous, the man who started fractal geometry, the guy who was behind it, did a lot of drawings that have a great similarity to that. Reformating. Now this is where it gets really fun. This is using the format or tropes, which is kind of language or conventions of a, a discipline um, in art. And we find this quite often, and this is a wonderful thing to do. Um, I do this with my students all the time because this is a very great storytelling technique because natural history illustrators and scientific illustrators are telling stories and giving information in visual ways. So you'll recognize some of this. Simon Evans is one of my favorites. He'll be my favorite tomorrow. I'm still hung up on uh, um, Zhang Hung too. Um, and here we have the floor plan for purgatory. <laughs> no, I want you to notice that purgatory has a men's room and a woman's room. It's really important and a great big hall of some sort. Simon Evans has a lot of wonderful things that you can find on the web where he uses different formats from science. Lots of mapping 
and um, but a lot of little charts and stuff like that I'll show you some more a lot of it you can't use in the classroom because he has bad language but if you can find the ones where he hasn't used bad language terrific new diagram of love okay so some of this is going to make sense and some of it is not. And that's one of the great things about Simon Evans is he doesn't always make much sense, but he does kind of in a way. It's sort of like this a sneaky sense, you know? It's sort of nonsense and sense all together. And he teases your mind. And this is a complex text that would be, you can sort of unwrap or unpack with your students. Um, and they can recognize the trope. Do you recognize what that is? What's the graphic? Cross it's a cross-section of a dog. Showing it's a biological illustration. It's something you would find in your biology book. And those of you who are in high school, your students are studying these kinds of drawings. Probably in middle school and upper elementary are studying these kinds of drawings seeing them in their biology classes, right? So what if they apply those to something else and use them? Use them as a tool, as a visual trope. This one you recognize as the rings of the tree. He's used a pencil, sharpened a pencil, and those are the sharpened stuff. And this is his first 14 years. And I bet you rec recognize the reflex reflexology chart, which is itself completely confusing. And does it really make sense? I'm not so sure. Sometimes I wonder about all that stuff, don't you? So yeah, so why not take it a step further? This is Hung Q Lee. Now that's cute, isn't it? This is Bugs Bunny. Bones, you recognize Snoopy, and of course Betty Boop. So um, here we have, of course, the trope of natural history applied to comic book characters. But you think that one's funny? Where do you see this one? I love Jason Freeney. He's got, and if you check him out on the web, tons of these things. And they're all hysterical. He really has a fun time with popular culture. And um, oh, I'll show you this one. I love this one, too. Uh, Remember Cooties? Yes. Oh, you know. And look, it's now a morphous. See? you could put your body together. <laughs> and the, um, this one is metaphor, which is a little more complex. But actually, you know, they say little kids don't understand metaphor, but they certainly know analogy. Something is like something else. And that's the root of metaphor. So you, use this, you can use this with your little kids. I, I am like a banana. Well, real not, I'm not like a banana today. Um, what am I more like? I'm, I'm like a cootie. I'm going to go back and look at the cootie. What am I like when I say I'm like something else? What does that say about me? And so it's a really, not, a really great way of actually going into identity is using metaphor. But um, casting one thing as another is really, I mean, that comes out of poetry, right? And writing. We use metaphors in our language all the time. We use them in our visual language as well. And it is a mainstay, a critical for, uh, block of art is metaphor. And um, artists these days use them in rather wa wonderful ways to talk about things in very economical terms. This is Doho So. This is, uh, he's one of my very favorite artists. And um, do you recognize what that is?
It's a traditional Korean home. May, and it's a little hard to see, maybe it's awfully light, but it's a traditional Korean architecture. And he makes, he's ma he made it out of silk, which is a traditional Korean fabric, right? A very durable, very light, very translucent, very sort of ephemeral feeling kind of stuff. And he's made his house out of that. And it's a tent. And that's why it's Seoul home, Baltimore home, New York home, LA home, Seattle home. He takes it with him. Just like we take our memories. Just like we take our childhood and our culture with us. Wherever we go, it's here. It's our home. So he's done it's a very profound thing with very with it with a, a material that has metaphorical meaning and a form that has metaphorical meaning. Here's another one about home. So you recognize here we have the, the traditional um, Korean architecture. There it is. It's, I mean, it's not in silk right now, but crashing down. This is, I leave it to you to re interpret this. But if you're talking to your students about what it means to come to, the, come to another country, what it's like to be, have culture, you know, sort of try to feel outside or feel like you just landed. What does that feel like? How does an artist talk about that? How does an artist talk about be being new in a place? David Wojnarowicz's portrait. Um, how many of us feel like sometimes we carry the universe in our heads, our own little universe? This, he, um, I'm going to let you ponder this one. I don't want to deconstruct it for you because I think that it really has so much in it. But I just want you to notice there's a microscope in there and for micro, and there's a lot of macro going on there with the planets. And this last of the metaphors is Francis Baker. He's another California artist, Bay Area. And he has a lot of commentary about uh, culture being a sort of a, um, container, something that forces you into a certain shape and a certain way of being. And he uses plants to talk about that and roots. So he casts these roots. Here, I'll show you. Um, in the shapes of things. This last one was a fist. Very metaphorical. Oh, here's the last one. Playing with Messon's form. Well, um, we're running late, too. Um, many artists now are playing with different kinds of methods. They're actually crossing disciplinary boundaries and becoming or play acting different scientists or social scientists or writers or historians or whatever. And this is Mark Dion, um, who did the, those delightful stuffed animal pieces that we just saw. Um, and here he is pretending to be an archaeologist, and he's digging around at the Thames River. And over here on the, um, to the, on, the re on your right side is um, one of his notebooks. He does a lot of notebooks and drawings, sort of like field study books, which come out of science. That's a tool that they use. It's a tool that he uses. And here he is out on the Thames pretending to be an archaeologist. And um, here he is a naturalist. And he does a lot of, uh, he did, he, well, he still does, um, a lot of ex exhibits that he lays out like a natural history person would do. So and he's the one who did the Cabinet of Curiosities. And he's got an arrow right in the middle of his head. Sorry about that. And this is Komar and Melamed. They're pretty funny. <clears throat> Komar and Melamed pretended to be social scientists, and they did a, a huge survey of a couple million people, they said. 
Um, and they uh, had a whole set of questionnaire of a, a whole set of questionnaires and that they sent to a number of different countries: Denmark, Turkey, China, the United States. Um, Czechoslovakia, well, no, it couldn't be Czechoslovakia. It's not there anymore. A number of other places, Switzerland, Belgium. And they asked these questions about what you like, size of things, colors, shapes, landscapes, things that are representative, what kind of imagery. And then they they did a statistical analysis of each country, and they came up with all these likes and dislikes. So I'm just going to show you a couple of each. This is um, China's most popular wanted landscape with water buffalo and a picture of some un unidentified leader and something really strange in the background. I don't know what that is. And this was the most unwanted. You can understand why. Abstract painting, I'm sorry, Nathan, lost out. Everybody wanted something representative. And this is America's most wanted. And recognize George and dear and happy people and least wanted abstract lost eye. sorry it, this was a very funny thing and um, in a lot of ways it really pointed out how similar um, likes and dislikes are but it also pointed out how banal it gets in the long run if you take a statistical analysis it all kind of blands out to the same thing. So, um, yeah. So I want to talk to you briefly about, and just show you a couple examples, maybe three or four examples, of how the, the uh, strategies work out in the classroom for creative inquiry. And um, so this first one is reformatting and storytelling. Remember we saw some reformatting using the tropes? of different um, science or whatever. Um, this one, um, they invented um, a plant. First of all, they made a seed. This is the front side, that's the back side. Made a seed out of ceramics, and then they painted it with acrylics. And then they had to imagine a, a plant growing from that seed that could do something to cure a social ill. So this was a medicinal plant. So here we have projecting and imagining and inventing. And um, then they had to figure out how, then we looked at a lot of seed packets and natural history illustrations, and they illustrated their plant and how it functioned. So that got to tell the story about it. And they had to figure out everything about it, its form, <laughs> its functions, all of that good stuff. And this is the trash tree, and then they had to write, then they wrote, um, instructions on how to plant it and nurture it and where it should go and all of that, and they made a seed packet. You can see some of the creative strategies we've been talking about today playing out in a project like this. And what I'd like to do is really name those strategic, those creative strategies so they become aware of their process, of their thinking. And also when I go to assess, I can find those things. I can see them happening. As creativity is so nebulous, and if we're trying to assess it, we really need to name what it is. We have to name it when we, and if we can give it a name, then we can assess whether it's there or not. Um, so, here's another example, a couple examples. Those are the front sides. This was actually in my class, and this is for elementary school. These are future elementary school teachers doing it in elementary school level. So uh, these, this is a, a project for younger kids. This is from high school. This is a very similar thing, but this is actually inventing a little machine. And this was at a uh, high school in San Francisco. And, um, <coughs> My friend, whose name I just just forgot his name, um, he was great. He invented this machine over here. It's called the e-machine. And the e-machine, the problem was that uh, students get so much stuff that they have to know, right? And they have to. 
put it in their head somehow and take a test. So he has the e-machine which shreds books. You can see the top part. You can shred the books. It makes this mulch and it goes directly into your brain. And so that was really helpful. Oh, his name is Eric. That's why it's called the e-machine. And then he did the instructions, and here he's building the package. And so we use the, t the notion of um, using a format to reflect on what he had done in his art piece. So here, that's the creative strategy we used. So here he is explaining to you how it works, and attach the machine onto your head and keep it stable. Allow the machine to warm up <laughs> left when you are, oh, best when you are something. I have to put on my glasses. I've got it here. Um, left button on bar grinder? Yeah. Box yeah, attach wanted knowledge in paper form into grinder. Um, something might better, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he explains it to you, and knowledge is power, you can never have excess. And so this is all the, um, as you can see, by having to do the instructions, which is a, is a kind of trope or format, he had to really think through it. And the same thing with the package. This is the package to show you how it works. <coughs> So um, mapping is a really great creative strategy, and this is a, um, done by a third grader who went to Muir Woods, and she mapped out all the things that she saw and sort of different things that she related it to. So um, she made her learning visible in the way an artist would or a scientist would. And she saw the different relationships between them. Now this project, they went to Muir Woods and um, they looked at a lot of redwood trees and they saw the cross section of the trees just like uh, Simon Evans. And so they did what Simon Evans did. They mapped their lives out on tree rings. And this one was, I, I didn't include it because it's very hard to read, but um, they put year one what they did year two, what they did, one thing from each year, and it's for eight years, of course, they're only eight years old, but um, the little biography in their little notebook, their little research book, and then they put it in the tree rings, and just to remind you what we're looking at, this is, the, what, this is what was the catalyst for this. So mapping is a big deal, and actually we do a lot of mapping of process. And I think that here I'm showing you actually um, creative strategies, not just in the artworks, but also in thinking about thinking and thinking about how you got to those products. This is from a high school. This is actually from an international baccalaureate program at Berkeley High School, and where they, they do these research workbooks on a theme, and then they map their creative process that they went through, their thinking processes. They take thinking words and they put them along the way. And this is Acacia who did a wonderful job. So this was her investigation roadmap. She was investigating that little animal that she made up. And metaphor. Um, one of the things that I think is really important is to think about using these creative strategies in not just the art pieces, but also in thinking about the way we do things. And so I wanted to read this to you. My thinking process is like a nonlinear ball of thoughts. It is like a ball of yarn with pieces all woven together and constantly connected. It can be unwoven to show progression of thinking outside, uh, but of thinking, but outside, something outside causes, oh no, wait a minute, I'm sorry. But outside causes always influence the way it connects connects. Sometimes I get, it gets bitten by a kitten and tangled in new ways. The kitten is life. Introducing new and seemingly random ideas that became, in, became incorporated. So it's about being linear, but then allowing things to get all kind of messed up, which is a lot of what we've been talking about today is artists sort of taking things that are sort of logical and linear and 
playing with them, switching them, using a creative strategy to change them around. And what Acacia is talking about here is something that is really important to the art, to, um, oh, now it won't go. Okay, let's try this. Let's try this. This, which is when we're thinking about thinking and thinking about um, what artists do and what you can do in your art class. Um, and about the kinds of things that, that we as artists and art teachers bring to schooling and to kids in a school situation where they're learning. And they're learning how to be logical and linear and remember things. We can help them to play with those things in a way that's artistic, kind of feel unlogical, kind of unlinear, kind of associative, and to see things differently. So what we call this is poetic logic, and it comes out of science. It comes out of, of complexity and chaos theory. Won't go there, it's too much to talk about. But these scientists who uh, have sort of come up with this idea are the ones that are on the cutting edge of fractal geometry, chaos and complexity theory, and all systems theory and stuff like that. And they think in a very linear and logical way, but they break out of it to think more metaphorically and associatively, to make new connections and to see things differently. And they've given it this name. It's a Greek name for, that comes out of the notion of autopoiesis or poetic. It means to grow, to grow of itself, where it, you have this sort of organic thing that just grows and sort of where it needs to go and is associative and, Sometimes you don't know quite what sense it's making. This is, I don't, I, I think you probably as artists and people who make art and work with kids who make art, know that happens when you do creative process, right? So it's a liberating of, there's sometimes you have to be very logical and linear, and sometimes you have to just let your mind do some creative strategies, strange juxtapositions, metaphorical associations, and those are the things where really deep new meaning and understandings are created. And anyone who's on the edge of any discipline, whether they're the sci sciences or the language arts or mathematics, plays with poetic logic. And the great thing about the art classroom is this, this is where we can highlight it. This is where we can really bring it forward. So that's why I call it creative, creativity for understanding, for new understandings. So anybody got any questions? <laughs> There are like 23 strategies in there. And there are a lot of examples of contemporary artists using those creative strategies. And then it's broken down the different kinds of purpose, knowledge, methods, and forms they're playing with from different disciplines. Science, math, social studies, um, history, geography, language arts. And the idea of it is to integrate on a very deep level on all those levels. Yeah. Uh, talking about the poetic model, are you, in the book you're talking about that running across just the art discipline, but are you working with the AP board as they're starting to structure more towards that with like AP human geography and things like that? I don't know much about that. Tell me. 
But that's on that, that's on that structure and actually this is the first year that they keep board with art history. Is AP. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Changing the, changing it. So I know that's kind of running through the pulse of all that right now. Really? How exciting. And that's AP great. Geography is that. There's actually a, a AP Human Geography. It's kind of going to supplant, they're trying to get that to supplant uh, geography and uh, history courses now because it's exactly what you're talking about. It's like, for example, we're all doing dive and bowl here pretty soon. <laughs> and so using that model this week, been talking to kids in my class and our class about black death. And, yeah. And because the, they all immediately go to that. And so human geography is structured that way. So the human geography class has got a book that represents more of the uh, Asian model of the geography books class, which is, you know, about 500 pages less than ours. Wow, it sounds fascinating. Can I go get something like that on Amazon? Actually, if you do it, it'd be great, because like, we have a really brilliant teacher at our school who's kind of spearheading it for the nation. He's, he's struggling with the book because he's used to teaching a very much, uh, it's cut his reading by about 75% for his students, but he's getting a lot more enjoyment in the class. He's a great teacher, very low teacher, but he's getting a lot more out of that. We're, we're talking more art about that, so it'd be great if you give to me a keyboard and can talk about it. They're looking for that. How exciting. Well, it's great to get the kids engaged because then they can go and do the reading when they feel like it, you know? If they, well, instead of doing it linearly. Yeah, they do it more, they do it more. spatially or gra graphically or non-linearly. Yes. Wonderful. That's great. Yeah. As an artist, how do you play with these different things? Okay, <laughs> that was a setup, folks. <laughs> But I don't know if we have time for that, Stephanie. Stephanie asked me for that earlier. I'll just show you one slide. I do, um, uh, do we have time for just a few minutes? Yeah. Let me see if I can find it here. OK, I'll just show you uh, really fast. Um, I'm really interested in integrated learning. So I, I do my own little graphics um, that I often show. Let me, I'll make this, I've, um, slide show. like that. That's my own work um, to graphically represent ideas that I'm interested in. So um, these are, um, we'll go through here, that one. Um, metaphor of landscape. So using the metaphor of landscape to talk about learning and understanding and um, all those uh, different aspects of it. So of course landscape is, fits into plant forms. I stole this trope from, um, you know, the whole notion of trees of knowledge. And I'm just working out this uh, way of uh, our integrated learning framework that I've been working on. And these are the different branches that we bring to um, other frameworks, creative inquiry, social justice, integration, and metacognition. So uh, it's a long story, and um, but just to show you that, um, see, oh yeah, I, I use my own illustrations. And a lot of this is metaphorical, and a lot of it is mapping, mapping and me metaphor and juxtaposition. So here we have a juxtaposition of the natural landscape versus the disciplinary landscape, which sort of kind of makes a ladder and a, a grid over it. If you look at it kind of conceptually, what a, a discipline is, it's sort of gridding over reality. It's kind of putting out, um, measuring it. And, and this is different kinds of knowledge. So that's one of my little collages. Integrated and foundational and new knowledge. And landscapes. So a lot of collage, and these are all, this is, uh, I give lots of different PowerPoints to people. And it's a lot of fun, but I really dislike PowerPoints. They're you know, sort of traditional, so I've tried to make an art form out of them. So I, I do my own collages and I put them in my little book. And I found that as I'm thinking through and, and doing a lot of research on this stuff, that actually making visual maps, graphs, concept maps, um, juxtapositions, metaphors, all of those, it's really helped me to think through um, this sort of what could also be sort of dry and linear in a much 
less linear, much more associative way. So um, that's kind of what I've been up to. So I, these are, oh, there's a child's See, the whole metaphor of landscape blossomed into globes and um, geology. And those are all my little illustrations. There's the creative inquiry path. If you're going um, into landscape, this notion of following this windy, crazy path that has dead ends and loops. But going through all of these different areas, geography, math, history, social studies, arts, and visiting these different ways, places along the way as you do your creative inquiry into a theme. And there it is again. OK, that's enough of that. Anyway, that's what I do. I try to use those creative strategies in my work. And I find uh, it's really changed my thinking about a lot of stuff. What's really great is even when you go to the museum tonight, when you go through the, I'm going to let you out of here now. You guys have been here a long time. You must be feeling a little like moving around. Let's see if you see any of those creative strategies in the art. The art that you see here tonight, you probably will. Um, they're very uh, prevalent in a lot of contemporary art, which we may see it in some of the 80s art. And it's really great for when you do a critique with your kids is to talk about the creative strategy they used, as opposed to talking about the formal qualities, perhaps. You know, what did you, what did you do? Oh, I juxtaposed this thing to that. Oh, this is a metaphor for that. Oh, oh my gosh, this, I layered that onto that. I fused it together. And that switches your critiques from, you know, sort of trying to figure out formal qualities, which are important too. You could do that as well. But it switches it to what are the conceptual strategies I'm using to make meaning. And the thing is that one of the really fun things is creative strategies, there are a million of them. And Everybody invents their own as they go along. And you can, once your kids get into talking about creative strategies and creative, you know, sort of these little things that they do that are very simple, that can be very, make for complex things, they can say, well, I did this. That was my creative strategy. And then you have a new one to put in your taxonomy of creative strategies. And you can just keep adding on. This is just the primer. <laughs> Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, uh, Gallery for Open Self Behavior is new music, 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 Thank you for coming.